somebody and a cat. It's something that is built in somebody. Um, and Jimmy, every time I, I don't want you blowing up my house or my car or anything like Good that. Good night! No, I'm I don't. <laughs> because I don't. I cannot. He already threatened to put me in the trunk of a car. And little Kim said, leave Jonesy alone. Jonesy don't hurt nobody. Stop. Yep. You saved me. You're my hero. Ever since Cassie filed her lawsuit against Diddy in November, the Bad Boy Records founder has been met with a barrage of allegations. He's been accused of S assault, physical and emotional AB, and much more. As his alleged victims continue to come forward with their stories, Miss Jones has joined the discussion, recently sharing her own experience with Diddy on Pink Champs. According to Miss Jones, one of her run-ins with Diddy was far from pleasant. And a cat, it's something that is built in somebody. Um, and Jimmy, every time I don't I want you blowing up my house or my car or anything like Good that. Good night! I'm done. No, because I don't. I cannot. He already threatened to put me in the trunk of a car. Fortunately, she says that Lil' Kim was there to save the day. In a clip from the episode, she recalls having him on her morning show, where she allegedly caught him threatening her. You know when we take you in the back room to do commercials when we have you on the radio, she said. He didn't know that the tape was running, and if I hadn't heard it, I wouldn't have believed it. Miss Jones claims that luckily, Lil' Kim came to her defense. Lil Kim said, leave Jonesy alone. Jonesy don't hurt nobody. Stop. Yup. Lil Kim saved me. She's my hero. So, I just say where there's smoke, there's fire. She also added. Miss Jones went on, describing how amid Diddy's allegations, men should stay silent unless they're speaking up for good. If you're not going to stand up for what's right, shut the F up, she said. Diddy has yet to respond to Miss Jones' allegations. In any case, this is not the first time that Lil Kim has stood up to Diddy. In fact, an audio clip of Lil Kim calling out Diddy has resurfaced, and let me tell you, it's not painting a pretty picture for Diddy. Locked up, never put a ten dollar bill, a, a penny, a quarter in my commissary. He never wrote me a letter. He didn't try to come see me. Lil Kim has claimed that Diddy cut her off when she went to prison and didn't bother to write or visit her. Naturally, she felt betrayed since Diddy was her only remaining friend after Biggie's death, but he didn't consider her part of his family anymore. That's why I said in my book for my show, Pop, you should be ashamed of yourself. Because at the end of the day, if you're gonna rock with anybody that hard, you should be rocking with me. That Lil Kim was deeply hurt and felt betrayed when Diddy didn't reach out to her after she was released from prison, but instead made music with her rival, Nicki Minaj. As Nicki was being hailed as the new queen of rap, Lil Kim felt like she was being disregarded and replaced by Diddy. She expressed her frustration by declaring that no one could ever create another Lil Kim, as she was the one and only true queen of rap. And you can't, you can never make another Big and Kim. That's not gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. It, it, like, what? Are you kidding me? You can sense the depth of Kim's betrayal when she boldly declared to the world that there could never be another Lil' Kim. She was the original and incomparable. The frustration intensified as 50 Cent joined the comparison game, referring to Nicki Minaj as the new Lil' Kim. In Kim's eyes, this constant comparison must have been exasperating. After her release from prison, she expected Diddy to acknowledge her, to hit the studio and lay down some beats with her. However, disappointingly, he chose Nicki instead. The whole situation likely left Kim feeling overlooked and undervalued in a moment where she needed support and recognition. You could have came to see me one time. You could have wrote me one letter. Even with the movie, they played the with that movie. And I'm still rocking, even after they played the movie with the movie. Adding to her frustration, Lil' Kim felt that Diddy played her in the movie that was made about Biggie. She claimed she was not given a say in how she was portrayed and did not appreciate being depicted as having no creative talent and only having a career because of her relationship with Biggie. She also felt disrespected when the movie suggested that Biggie wrote all her songs, even though she wrote her own lyrics and only went to him for guidance when she needed it. She also claimed she was young when she had a relationship with Biggie and didn't know any better about not being with a married man, although she claimed she really did love him and he loved her back. In any case, before abandoning Lil' Kim in jail, Diddy had also not only abandoned, but allegedly had a hand in the unaliving of his friend and artist Biggie. You see, according to Gene Deal, who appeared on DJ Vlad's vlog, it was reported that Biggie had plans to leave Bad Boy for a more profitable opportunity that could have yielded him over $60 million. This decision would not have been advantageous to Diddy. Despite being recognized as a legendary musician, Biggie was being paid a mere couple hundred dollars by Diddy, and all his music rights were held by 
by him. Although he was generating substantial revenue for Bad Boy, he was receiving minimal compensation. Deal confirmed this by sharing that he had seen Biggie's Bad Boy contract while keeping an eye on Diddy's briefcase during a flight. The contract revealed that Biggie's earnings were set at increments of $250,000, but the publishing income was owned by Puff. Deal expressed doubts about the contract's credibility and asked Biggie about it, who reportedly revealed his intentions to pursue a new deal that would result in greater profits. He showed me it had Charlie Baltimore, Cameron, Lil Cease, Lil Kim, Junior Mafia, Tracy Lee, and the Commission he explained. I think the contract was for so many years for like $62 million. According to Deal, it appears that Biggie wanted Junior Mafia to change their business approach and start writing and producing their own music. This was the reason why he planned to leave Bad Boy Records. Despite his departure, Biggie intended to continue to mentor Lil' Kim and take Deal with him to his next label. However, he believed that Gene was too loyal to Puffy and would not consider leaving. This information suggests that Biggie's departure would have had a significant impact on Diddy, and the latter did not want that. Although some argue that Diddy may not have been involved in Biggie's M, he likely knew who was responsible. According to a retired FBI agent who worked on the case, P. Diddy may have been the intended target in the shooting, and it's possible that he knew about the hit. Perhaps Diddy no longer saw Biggie as a friend after he decided to leave. In fact, Gene claimed that on that ill-fated night, someone had marked Biggie's car, and it is possible that the responsible individual might be Diddy. For context, Gene Deal disclosed that the cars in question were decorated with new numerous attention-grabbing stickers. While this detail may seem insignificant, it holds significance as evidence. The revelation indicates that these cars were rented, and applying stickers is a clear violation of rental policies, raising notable concerns. Adding to the intrigue, Gene Deal asserted that the only plausible party capable of tampering with the vehicles was the street team employed by Bad Boy Records. He contended that they were uniquely positioned to place the incriminating stickers, emphasizing the exclusive opportunity and access they had. Interestingly, Diddy's car remained devoid of any stickers, introducing an element of suspicion into the equation. Because somebody wanted to know, yo, if y'all gonna get big, to go to car with the stickers on. While the investigation into Biggie's tragic case unfolded, the head honcho of security let slip a tantalizing hint. He vaguely alluded to some mysterious tasks entrusted to the street team, but he conveniently kept the details under wraps. Now, with this fresh batch of information revealing an inside connection between the culprit and the victim, it seems highly probable that the mole within the street team had a pivotal role in orchestrating the diabolical scheme that separated Biggie's car from Diddy's. So only one that has an opportunity Opportunity, and only one that could have done that was somebody from the street team. Meanwhile, Gene also revealed that Biggie was fully aware that Diddy had been swiping some serious cash from his pockets. But here's the twist. Biggie himself was no angel either. It seems like there was a double dose of thievery happening within their so-called friendship. But wait, there's more to this sordid tale. Gene, in a shocking expose, spilled the beans on another grave sin committed by Diddy. Brace yourselves, for this revelation will send chills down your spine. Despite the dangerous feud raging between the East and West Coasts, Diddy, the one entrusted with managing Biggie's career, shockingly refused to up security. What's more, Gene pointed fingers at yet another individual who he believes was in cahoots with Puffy, working hand-in-hand -hand to execute the dastardly attack. According to Gene's daring claims, he personally warned a member of Biggie's entourage to stay far away from Puffy's designated route. And guess what? This person, none other than D-Rock, promised to heed Gene's words of caution. But in a shocking twist of events, D-Rock betrayed his own word and steered Biggie right right into the heart of that ill-fated after-party at Peterson Museum. Can you believe the audacity? Anyway, Gene suspects that D-Rock wasn't acting alone in this treacherous betrayal. Oh no, according to his speculations, Diddy himself had a sneaky hand in the whole affair. To support his claims, Gene dropped a bombshell by sharing the revelations made by Kirk Burroughs. Apparently, Biggie was initially scheduled to jet off to London with Kirk, but in a twist of fate, Gideon D-Rock managed to persuade the late rapper to ditch the London plans and attend that notorious after party instead. While the statements made by Gene may be considered controversial, it's important to note that they do not hold any legal weight at this point. However, it seems that Gene is not yet done spilling the tea. Believe it or not, Gene has previously exposed a stunning truth that will make you question everything. Despite having a security team consisting of seven to eight individuals, the majority of them were shockingly unarmed. This mind-boggling disclosure raises serious doubts about the level of protection provided to Biggie on that fateful night. Now, many of you might be scratching your heads 
and wondering why in the midst of the explosive feud between the East and West Coasts, were Biggie security personnel not carrying any firearms? Well, according to Gene, the answer is quite simple. It all came down to the employer's orders. And let's face it, we all know who that employer was, don't we? It's becoming increasingly evident that there were some major security blunders on that fatal night. Gene shed light on the fact that everyone involved knew about Biggie's health condition. They were well aware that he couldn't run or defend himself in a dangerous situation. So, logically speaking, the absence of armed guards simply does not make any sense at all. In any case, Gene made it abundantly clear that he doesn't believe Diddy ever genuinely cared about Biggie. In Gene's opinion, Diddy was only interested in Biggie's talent and had signed him to his label in order to promote his own success. Now, most of you might not know this, but in his shady efforts to be successful, Diddy has faced one too many lawsuits. In 1991, as a fledgling producer in New York's music industry, Combs, then 22, helped to promote a celebrity charity basketball event at City College that included the rapper Heavy D. A surging crowd for the oversold game led to a stampede that resulted in the deaths of nine people and injuries to more than two dozen others. While no criminal charges were filed, a state judge's decision found the college and Combs and Heavy D equally liable for the tragedy, paving the way for nearly a dozen wrongful death and personal injury lawsuits. In 2000, the last of the lawsuits involving Combs was settled for an undisclosed amount. In 1995, a limousine driver, Cedric Bobby Lemon, said he was beaten by bodyguards Combs hired to protect the singer Mary J. Blige. In a lawsuit, Lemon said the guards punched and kicked him backstage at a concert as they tried to clear the area and accused Combs of having failed to properly train his security. Lemon won the suit by default after Combs did not appear in court. His spokeswoman said he was unaware of it. In 2004, an appeals court overturned the order that required Combs to pay Lemon $450,000. Fast forward to 1999, Combs was arrested on felony charges in New York and accused of beating rival record executive Steve Stout after a reported dispute over a music video scene in which Combs was nailed to a cross. Combs later apologized, and Stout asked the Manhattan District Attorney to drop the charges, according to the New York Times. A lawsuit was avoided, but Combs reportedly agreed to pay Stout $500,000. In another alleged altercation, Roger Mills, a Detroit-based cable TV host, accused Combs and his entourage of attacking him after he refused to sell Combs a video interview in which he was asked about his involvement in the 1997 unsolved unaliving of Biggie Smalls. In 2001, Mills sued Combs alleging assault, false imprisonment, and destruction of property. A spokeswoman for Combs denied the claims and accused Mills of a blatant attempt to exploit Mr. Combs' celebrity for media attention. The case went to trial, and a jury in 2004 ruled in favor of Combs on all counts. Finally, at the end of 1999, Combs was engulfed in controversy with an arrest in which he was accused of criminal possession of a weapon after a shooting at a New York nightclub. Combs was at the club with then-girlfriend Jennifer Lopez and the rapper Shine, real name Moses Barrow, whom witnesses said they saw fire a gun into a crowd. Witnesses said they also saw Combs with a weapon, according to prosecutors. Shortly after the incident, police pulled over Combs and Lopez and said they had located a firearm inside the car. Shine was arrested and convicted in 2001 on two counts of assault, reckless endangerment and firearm possession, and he was later deported to his native Belize. Combs was acquitted of weapons and bribery charges. A multi-million dollar lawsuit filed by three people injured in the shooting was settled for an undisclosed amount in 2011, Reuters reported. Combs declined to comment about the agreement at the time. In 2001, Combs was sued by his on and off again girlfriend, the model Kim Porter, for additional child support for their then three-year-old son. A settlement was eventually reached in Manhattan Family Court. The couple co-parented four children together, and Porter died in 2019 of pneumonia. In 2005, Random House and Combs reached a settlement after the publishing giant said he was given a $300,000 advance for a memoir he was supposed to have finished in 1999 but never completed. The book deal was scrapped. In 2007, a former consultant, James Sabatino, sued Combs for $19 million, alleging that Combs failed to pay him in full for a recording he made of Biggie in Miami in 1994. The suit was dismissed in 2009. Separately, Sabatino was at the center of a fraudulent article involving involving Combs and the slain rapper Tupac Shakur that forced the Los Angeles Times to retract a bombshell story in 2008. Also in 2007, Gerard Recknitzer, a partygoer in Los Angeles, said Combs punched him in the face as he was leaving a post-Oscars hotel event and caused him to fly backwards several feet, according to a lawsuit. He also claimed in the lawsuit that Combs pushed his girlfriend. 
An attorney for Combs disputed the complaint as just another example of an opportunist seeking to fabricate a lawsuit. A settlement was reached in 2008. The terms were not disclosed. In 2010, Francesca Sparrow, a music executive in her 50s, sued Combs for age discrimination, saying she was fired after having worked for him since 1998. The company denied she was let go because of her age, and Combs settled the multi-million dollar suit in 2011. In 2011, Paparazzo Gustavo Garces filed a suit in which he said Combs' bodyguards assaulted him on New Year's Eve as he took a picture of him outside the Dream Hotel in Miami. A settlement was reached in 2017, in which Garces agreed to receive $35,000 in exchange for releasing Combs, his bodyguards, and their insurance company from liability. In 2017, Cindy Rueda, Combs' personal chef in 2015, filed a suit claiming she was subjected to S harassment and worked long hours without being properly compensated. In her complaint, Rueda said Combs told her to cook a post-coital meal and wanted to know whether she was attracted to his unclothed body. Rueda was fired in 2016, and a spokeswoman for Combs described her as a disgruntled ex-employee. She settled with Combs in 2019. The terms were not publicly disclosed. In 2022, a former nanny working for Combs, Raven Wales Walden, filed a suit against Combs alleging wrongful termination after she said she disclosed her pregnancy in 2020. Wales Walden also said she was a niece of Porter's. In a response filed this year in Los Angeles County Superior Court, Combs denied that she is Porter's niece and that she was discriminated against. A spokesman for Combs called the suit, which continues, a meritless shakedown to extort money from Mr. Combs. And now, most recently, on November 16, 2023, singer Cassie, whose full name is Cassie Ventura, initiated legal proceedings by filing a lawsuit in federal district court in Manhattan, accusing hip-hop mogul Diddy of physically a being her over their decade-long relationship. Ventura and Diddy, whose real name is Sean Combs, reportedly crossed paths in 2005 when she was 19. And the following year, she signed to Combs' record label, Bad Boy Records, releasing her debut album. Their romantic involvement began in 2007. As per documents obtained by the New York Times, Ventura alleges that Combs started displaying signs of control and AB after the release of her debut album. She claims that he aggressively encouraged her to consume excessive amounts of and was frequently violent throughout their relationship until it ended in 2018. The detailed court lawsuit provides shocking details about multiple incidents where Diddy allegedly essayed and aried the singer. In a statement through her lawyer, Ventura declared, after years in silence and darkness, I am finally ready to tell my story and to speak up on behalf of myself and for the benefit of other women who face violence and AB in their relationships. Diddy's attorney Ben Braffman vehemently denied the allegations, stating that the lawsuit aimed to tarnish Combs' reputation. A day after Cassie filed the lawsuit, the former couple reportedly settled the case for an undisclosed amount. In an official statement following the settlement, Cassie expressed her decision to resolve the matter amicably on terms she could control. Diddy's lawyer, Ben Braffman, confirmed the settlement but clarified that it did not imply an admission of wrongdoing. On November 22, Macy's announced the phased-out discontinuation of Diddy's Sean John fashion brand. Despite a decade-long exclusive distribution deal with Macy's, the department store revealed it was evaluating its brand portfolio, not explicitly linking the decision to Cassie's lawsuit. On November 23rd, Diddy faced a second lawsuit from a woman accusing him of essay dating back to 1991 during her time as a student at Syracuse University. The lawsuit alleges that after dining at a Harlem restaurant, Diddy took her to a studio, and essayed her, even filming the act and sharing it with others, resulting in a revenge pee claim. November 24th brought a third lawsuit against Diddy, this time from a woman identified as Jane Doe, alleging essay around 1990 or 1991 at a New York event. The suit claims that Diddy and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall essayed her and her friend, with Diddy later assaulting and choking Jane Doe at her home. About a week after Cassie's initial lawsuit, Roger Bonds, a former leader of Diddy's security team, came forward on Instagram Instagram, backing Cassie's side of the story. He claimed to have intervened in a 2009 incident and suggested he had saved many other women from AB by Diddy. On November 28, 2023, in response to the allegations, Diddy temporarily stepped down as chairman of media company Revolt. TMZ reported that the reduced role was temporary. On the same day, Capital Preparatory Charter Schools ended their partnership with Diddy, citing an evaluation made in light of ongoing essay allegations and legal issues. In any case, while none of the 
these insiders have explicitly confirmed their intention to testify, the looming uncertainty must undoubtedly be unnerving for Diddy. The uncertainty of when or if the court will summon him to address the charges adds an additional layer of anxiety to the situation. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.